usually when I ask neuroscientists how you encode a number either in a synapse or however many synapses they think might be necessary, that's a conversation stopper. All I get is hand waves, you know. Well, you see, there are lots of synapses and uh, <laughs> it's a pattern of synapses. Well, could you say something about the pattern? I mean, how does the pattern for 11 different for the pattern from three, for example? Could you shed a little light on that? People do not want to answer that question. The engram is the low hanging fruit because it has a really simple job to store the information, just like DNA's job is to store the information. What is the role of synaptic plasticity? <laughs> I, I honestly have no idea. Since I literally believe that an associative bond never formed in the brain of any animal, and since the plastic synapse is transparently conceived of as uh, an associative bond, right? I certainly don't think that's what they are. Could they play a role in the computations carried out in signals? Sure. This is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, it's Paul. Ingram. It's a term coined by Richard Seaman in the early 1900s, and it refers to the physical substrate that stores the information that makes up our memories. In other words, the, the trace of our memories. We still don't have a definitive answer to the question of how our brains store memories, what makes up the engram. Many neuroscientists would say a given memory resides in a specific pattern of neurons and the activity of those neurons, and that the formation of new memories and changes in existing memories, that is, learning, depends on changes in the connections between neurons, synaptic plasticity. And of course, training deep learning artificial networks is fueled by adjusting the weights between their units to learn tasks. But not everyone agrees with this story, that memories are somehow stored in neural connectivity patterns and the activity of the neurons in those patterns. As Tomas Ryan puts it, and Tomas will be on my next episode, at what level does an engram lie? Is an engram in the cell or is a cell in the engram? Randy Gallistol is my guest today, He's a distinguished professor emeritus at Rutgers, and he's been at this for over 60 years. And he's been arguing much of those 60 years that the engram must lie within the cell, not that a cell is in the engram. And his argument, which you'll hear him flesh out, is that brains are computational organs, and to compute, you need symbols, namely numbers. And Randy thinks the only reliable way to store numbers over long periods of time, which is necessary, and to be able to read from those numbers and write new numbers is to use subcellular molecules like DNA or RNA or something similar. He also details his arguments in a great book, Memory in the Computational Brain, with Adam King, which was published over 10 years ago. I recommend that book. I have distinct uh, episodic memories uh, reading that book in my office in Nashville, for example, and I've gone back to it uh, multiple times since then. It goes over the fundamentals of information theory and uses examples from animal behavior like navigation and foraging uh, to argue his case. So today we talk about some of those ideas, uh, some of the evidence to support those ideas, and a host of other bells and whistles, including his long, successful career studying the many abstract processes underlying our learning, memory, and behavior. You can find show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 126. On the website, you can also choose to support the podcast through Patreon and join our uh, Brain Inspired Discord community if you want uh, and get access to all the full episodes I publish through Patreon, or just to throw a couple dollars my way each month to express your appreciation. I appreciate you listening. Uh, I hope this podcast is enriching your minds and bringing you some joy. Here's Randy. Uh, Randy, you're 80? You just told me you're 80 years old. Yes. <laughs> Well, uh, when when did you turn 80? Uh, back in May. Okay, well, happy belated 80th. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I know that you have been interested in memory 
since the 1960s. A- at what point, so, you know, we'll get to the, uh, the big idea uh, here in a moment, but at what point in your career did you start questioning the uh, typical neuroscience story about memory? Uh, way back in the 60s, uh, when I was an undergraduate in Tony Deutsch's lab and uh, deciding that I wasn't going to be a social psychologist, I was going to be a physiological psychologist, as we called them in those days, and now we call them behavioral neuroscientists. And uh, I really became an apostate uh, uh, during while running my first experiment, which was a, a, a runway experiment uh, with rats, and I would watch them. And just watching the rats, I became absolutely persuaded that they um, they knew what they were doing. They uh, <laughs> it wasn't habits. Uh, I had already become enamored of Hull's vision of a mathematically rigorous theory of mind and, and brain computation, what we would now call computational neuroscience. Uh, but um, I had already become an apostate from the rest of his doctrine because I, you know, with all, it was all habits. And of course, there are many computational neuroscientists for which that's still true. Uh, mm. that's, <laughs> that's what I mean when I said a moment ago before we were recording that uh, uh, nothing has changed in the 60 years, right? I, I go to meetings now and I listen to some of the talks. I think this is the same shit I was listening to in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so, you know, one of the things that um, you talk about in your book, um, Memory and the Computational Brain, Why Cognitive Science Will Transform Neuroscience, is that there is this large gap between cognitive science and neuroscience. Uh, and, and I heard you talk recently and you've written... Uh, about this as well, that, you know, actually even back, that was 2009, 2010, when that book came out, and uh, computational neuroscience was still a small swath of neuroscience writ large, right? But that's changed, hasn't it? Has has computational neuroscience, which to me seems like is the majority of neuroscience. What What's your view on that? Has computational neuroscience come along? Well, in terms of the number <laughs> and quality of people doing it, yes. I, I certainly don't see it as dominating neuroscience. I mean, neuroscience. You know, I, that, I assume you bias. go to the annual, you know, the meeting, uh, the Society for Neuroscience, there are 30,000 people there, right? I mean, there are uh, two poster sessions a day in this. Uh, yeah, the poster sessions are so big that even if you trotted, you couldn't go buy all the posters, right? And there are two of them every day and so on. And, you know, it's computational neuroscience is kind of small in the, than that big picture. And also, when I think about it, uh, computational neuroscience, I guess, or at least certainly in my worldview, was dominated by vision people back in the day, right? I mean, it still been, is. They've been very computational now for decades. In fact, there's a fascinating uh, book by um, by Hubel and, and Weasel, uh, in which they reproduce their papers. Uh, it was a, clearly a, a project of David Hubel, and, uh, and they reproduce 25 of their classic papers. And there are introductions and epilogues to each paper mm-hmm. by Hubel, and he repeatedly rants against the mathematician, uh, you know, the math of the fact that all the engineers and mathematicians have come into vision, right? Because like so many of the early people, he really didn't know much mathematics, right? Right, and, right. And, and these days, you cannot do cutting edge vision without a fairly serious mathematics education, right? Um, but that was already true 30 years ago. Um, so... I think what you're reacting to is now, of course, there are many people uh, doing computational neuroscience and focusing on learning and memory, which did not used to be true. I mean, Mm. those fields used to be completely non-mathematical, right? I've had more than one colleague and friend tell me they went into this business precisely because they didn't have to learn mathematics. Right. Yeah. (laughs) That's, That's right. Yeah, well, I mean, it seems like these days, and uh, and I again, this is my own bias because I uh, I learned computational neuroscience through my career. 
my short kind of uh, academic career. But going in, I didn't really, I had some mathematics background, but I didn't have modeling background. I didn't have, you know, a real, a good footing in the computational world. So I kind of learned that through my training. Um, but didn't you, you kind of applied yourself and learned some necessary mathematics a little bit later in your career, no? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I'm, I've been learning various bits of mathematics throughout the last 60 years. Um, I, for example, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I had the calculus as an undergraduate, but I didn't have, um, linear algebra and, uh, oh, I, gosh, yeah. I took the undergraduate linear algebra course at Irvine during, after I was already in a tenured associate professor during my first sabbatical when I was, uh, wor working with Duncan Luce and studying also linear systems theory, which I also basically taught myself. I went partly, of course, Duncan was uh, two orders of magnitude better mathematician than I ever imagined uh, I would ever be. But he was incredibly good at explaining things. And I was teaching myself by reading various textbooks on linear systems theory. And there was stuff, I, for example, I remember I could not wrap my mind around the convolution integral. So I said, Duncan, can you explain the, what convolution is? And he sat me down. And I emerged a half hour later, I absolutely understood what convolution was. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was on a, did he use a blackboard or did he use PowerPoint? I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think it was basically just verbal, although he may have, it would, and this is a long time ago we're talking about it, it would have been the blackboard. There may have been some recourse to the blackboard, but mostly, well, anyway, somehow he, he, he found there were examples that made it clear. And then I was able to use it. And that was very satisfying. If, if you had to go back, would you enter by studying mathematics first? Because I ask because you have a deep knowledge of uh, the behavior surrounding learning and memory, which you also had to have to get to where you are. Yeah, sure. Well, that was, I mean, first of all, that was what I took courses in. And second of all, I'm I mean, that's what I taught for 50 years, right? So, uh, you, the, the behavior, I'm, the more mathematical treatment, I rarely taught at the undergraduate level, right? Because it would take a very special mm -hmm. undergraduate seminar to do it. I did teach it at the graduate level. Uh, and as every teacher knows, you don't really understand the subject until you tried to teach it. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's... Yeah. Uh, you get sometimes this experience where you're busy explaining. This happened to me even when I was teaching introductory psychology. I'm halfway through an explanation, and all of a sudden, a little voice says, "You know what you're saying doesn't make sense to you." <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a terrible. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> That's true. You, you really find out what you don't know <laughs> yeah, right. when you teach. Wait a second, right? This argument has just gone off the tracks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, this idea of the um, the brain as a uh, computing device, among other things, has dominated your thoughts for uh, a few decades now, right? Oh, um, since, uh, since way back. Um, since way back, yeah. Yeah, and so I was in graduate school at Yale, a very behaviorist school, um, in Neil Miller's lab. <laughs> uh, you know, he was Hull's um, most prominent student. Uh, but I had, as I said, I'd already become a heretic uh, as an undergraduate, <laughs> so uh, I wasn't buying it, uh, nor was I buying it when I took the advanced course in learning from Alan Wagner. Meanwhile, I was building special purpose computers to run the experiments I was running, and I was reading the theory of computation and, and books on how computers worked and so on. And uh, and people and Chomsky was coming along. I went to a talk. This guy I'd barely heard of, Noam Chomsky, he came to speak at Yale. Uh, and I'd just been reading the the stuff that Skinner and uh, Osgood had written on language. Uh, I didn't know anything about language, but I thought this is rubbish. Um, <laughs> and and so I went to hear this talk by Chomsky, and I was an instant convert. I thought, <laughs> okay, this isn't rubbish. <laughs> so I, uh, I embraced the computational theory of mind, and I've 
thought since those days. I mean, I mean, many of these days, most neuroscientists pay lip service at least to it, right? But many of them would immediately add, yes, a brain computes, but it doesn't compute the way a computer computes. <laughs> yeah, this is the story. And having yeah. studied how computers compute, and uh, I mean, I've programmed all the way down to the machine level, right? So I, I, I know how go, what goes on under the hood and so on. And uh, I've always thought, well, wait a second, there isn't any other way to compute. I mean, <laughs> well, tell me how it is you compute, but not the way computers compute, right? I thought, I thought Turing settled that. <laughs> Mm. Well, so, so so I had a, a brain inspired listener uh, question about Chomsky's influence on you. So, well, it really you remember going to a talk and and having that sort of solidify oh. uh, your approach. Oh yeah, I, I remember being very impressed. And then I read his. Well, it didn't come out till later, but when it came out, I read his reflections on language. But mm -hmm. also at Penn. Penn was a cognitive science was very much a happening thing at Penn. And I had colleagues like Lila Gleitman and Henry Gleitman and Duncan Luce. So I was uh, strongly influenced uh, by, by them. Uh, and Dick Nicer was on sabbatical there the second year I was an assistant professor. Um, so I was influenced by all of those people. And all of those people were influenced by Chomsky. I mean, Chomsky. Chomsky sort of ran through the way we all thought. There's a kind of interesting story about that. Some years later, after I'd been publishing a bunch of stuff, and this is quite a number of years later, um, Noam, whom I'd met once or twice, and who I've often corresponded with subsequently, but he wrote me a very polite letter. It's a letter, I think. This was before email. Um, <laughs> gently complaining that I was uh, channeling him without ever citing him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I was very embarrassed. And I thought, you know, he's absolutely right. So, uh. so I wrote back apologizing and saying, look, you're so much a part of the intellectual milieu in which I swim. I just didn't occur to me to acknowledge or even recognize my intellectual debts. Anyway. Interesting. So, okay. Well, may, we, maybe we can return to Chomsky later, but because I know you wrote a manuscript in 2006, I believe, where you acknowledge the reflections on language and how that also influenced you. But I assume you got the letter before 2006 because oh, email yes. was around. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I had, it was yeah. a long time ago. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, memory in the computational brain, uh, of course, you, um, you detail your ideas uh, in that book. But you've also, you know, continued writing, um, and you know, I, there's a recent 2017 piece on the coding question, where you re revisit these I these ideas, and you you've continued to give talks about them. So maybe just in the broadest strokes, uh, could you summarize your the idea and your uh, position, um, and then we can kind of uh, go through some of the details as needed. So. Computation is operations on symbols, um, right? Um, before the emergence of computing machines, symbols and representations, all those things were regarded as hand waves, right? Uh, but with computing machines, when someone said, well, what do you mean by symbol? You say, well, you see this bit register? <laughs> you see that pattern of ones and zeros that's been put into that? Uh, those switches, <laughs> that's the number eight. <laughs> that's what I mean by a symbol, right? That, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's nothing even faintly mystical about it. It's, uh, it's a fundamental, um, in this sense, symbols are the stuff of computation, where I'm using stuff in the physical sense, right? It's, mm -hmm. They're the material realization upon which computational operations operate, right? And uh, once I got into information theory, I, I realized, yeah, right. And an even better way of putting it, and this became apparent in the book with Adam King, that these symbols carry forward in time information in Shannon's sense of the term. Right? Um, so that you can quantify, right? You can say, look, this physically 
realized thing is carrying this amount of information. Right? So, so you could wave aside all the fears about dualism and so on that tormented the behaviorists were all terrified by the specter of dualism, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so what is, as far as I'm concerned, the computers just put paid to those worries, right? You, uh, you had a completely physical theory. It was, uh, I thought then and still think, gave you a viable theory of mind. Keep in mind, when I, at Stanford and Yale, in the behaviorist days, if you said, well, the rat expects to find food at the end of the runway, you could see they were saying, well, I don't think we maybe should have admitted him. <laughs> uh, somebody who's so soft headed as to talk about expectations, right? But because it was related to theory of mind or? Yeah, of course, uh, maybe because, yeah. Uh, because before the appearance of computers, uh, I mean, Skinner denounced expectations in the most uncompromising terms as mm -hmm. unscientific, right? So you couldn't see them, you you you, <laughs> you couldn't feel them. They they had no business in science, and uh, of course, as soon as you began programming computers, you would set up one number that was going to be compared to another number in such and such a mm -hmm. case, and so then I would just turn them and say, "Hey, look." Here's my program. It runs on that machine. I don't think there's a ghost in that uh, little computer I built. <laughs> and this number is what it expects. And this is the operation by which it compares another number to that to decide whether what it expects was actually the case. End of story. Get off my back. Um, yeah. But is that, a, is that a redefinition of expectation over the years toward a more... Because, you know, the word expect one conjures uh, a notion of someone having a subjective feeling of expectation, right? But now when someone says expect, at least in the cognitive science, computational neuroscience world, all you think of is like a predictive processing, uh, numerical sure. abstract process. Sure. Now these days where everybody's talking about prediction error, uh, they're taking for granted that there's an expectation in the terms in which I'm talking about it. I'm never worried about these phenomenological things, right? Like, what does an expectation feel like? Eh, mm -hmm. eh, not the kind of question I'm interested in. <laughs> Why not? I, because I don't think it's uh, possible to get hold of it in a strong way uh, for just the reasons you were pointing out, right? Uh, that is, look, all I need for expectation is what I just described, right? And uh, it's perfectly clear. And there's no problem with it now that we have computing machines and we see this going on all the time. When people ask, well, does the computer feel the way I feel when I have an <laughs> expectation? I think, uh, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> uh, it's not the kind of question I'm interested in, right? In fact, if you notice what I've worked on almost entirely, particularly in recent years, uh, last few decades, it's what I call the psychophysics of the abstract quantities. Uh, distance, duration, probability, numerosity, and so on. The quantities that are a fundamental part of our experience, but they have no qualia, right? I mean, <laughs> what? Oh, no, it? you said qualia. Uh-oh. <laughs> Well, I said it precisely to say that if you work on those things, you don't worry about qualia because they have no qualia. <laughs> I mean, if people say, what does a duration feel like? <laughs> right? So all the philosophers that are beating themselves up about, uh, you know, what's it like to be a bat? Um, and, and they're all worried about qualia. Well, uh, qualia just isn't something I worry about uh, because... Uh, first of all, I think the qualia are the things that have qualia are of relatively minor interest. If you want to know what behavior is founded on, it's founded on the abstractions I was just talking about: the probabilities, the, the numbers, the durations, the directions, the distances. All all these abstractions, they're what drive behavior all the way down to insects, right? As you probably know, I'm a huge fan of the insect navigation literature, right? 
You like the bees, you like the ants, you like the, uh, yeah. The butterflies, the beetles, <laughs> the, butterfly. the dung beetles, yeah. <laughs> the dung beetles walking backwards with their ball of dung, <laughs> walking home backwards. <laughs> Maybe the central argument or one of the central arguments is that the story in neuroscience that the numbers and the numerical abstract symbols, I should just say symbols, uh, are encoded in the synapses, right? In the connections between neurons among populations of neurons, but you have a hard time believing that that could be the case. Well, actually, I usually, when I ask neuroscientists how you encode a number, either in a synapse or however many synapses they think might be necessary, mm -hmm. that's a conversation stopper. Um, I don't know if you ever viewed my the YouTube of my talk at Harvard where uh, John Lisman was the discussant, and uh, I, I posed that question at the end of my talk, saying, "John, when you get up here, I'll, you'll tell us how you store a number in a synapse." And he got up and gave a lengthy discussion in which he never brought that topic up. And this was a very unusual in that I got a rebuttal. I would got another chance to speak, and I. I said, John, I'm going to give you another chance. <laughs> How do you store a number in a synapse? Come on, John. <laughs> uh, and the audience began to laugh. And he stood up, and he would not, he would not answer the question. Um, and I had a somewhat similar experience with Jean-Pierre Changeux much more recently. Uh, in fact, the question made him so angry that he wouldn't allow the debate to be uploaded to, to, to YouTube. <laughs> oh, wow. I was going to say, I didn't see that one. <laughs> um, so, and I've gone so far often in my talks to say, come on, guys, I can offer you two alternatives. Uh, I mean, it's not as if it's impossible to think of an answer to what I just said. And I often proceed to say, well, look, uh, the synapse is usually conceptualized by computational neuroscience as a real valued variable, right? Mm -hmm. And distance, direction, probability, they're all real valued variables, right? So you can always represent a real valued variable by a real valued variable, right? So we could say, well, if the synapse is this, if the weight is this big, then the distance is that far, right? And if the weight is this big, you want to go there? I found practically no one wants to go there. Okay, yeah. you, you don't want to go there. Here's a radically different alternative. Suppose we have a bank. Uh, the people who talk about the uh, synaptic plasticity are very vague about how many states a synapse can assume. But one school of thought thinks they're binary. All right. Binary, I like that. That's a switch. <laughs> okay, so we'll have an array of binary synapses, and we throw this uh, synapse to this state and this synapse to the zero state, and now we've got something just like a computer register. You like that story? No, most people don't like that story. All right, what's your story? Uh, and at that point, all I get is hand waves, you know. Well, you see, there are lots of synapses, and uh, it's a pattern of synapses. Well, could you say something about the pattern? I mean, how does the pattern for 11 different for the pattern from three, for example? Could you shed a little light on that? People do not want to answer that question, because to answer that question is to admit that there are symbols in the brain. And even to this day, many people do not want to go there. And what's your answer? My answer is that it isn't in the synapses. <laughs> I mean, I point out that there are several labs around the world that are busy studying how to use bacterial DNA as the memory elements in a conventional computer. Right. Any engineer, anybody familiar with com the computing machines that actually work, uh, and that we know how they work, you know, once you show them a polynucleotide and explain that any nucleotide can be adjacent to any other nucleotide, any engineer worth a site says, whoa, I could store numbers in that like nobody's mm -hmm. business. Uh, in fact, 
uh, one of the people who introduced me in a talk I gave a couple of years ago in the introduction showed a very grainy video of a running horse where the video, the entire video had been passed through bacterial DNA. <laughs> right. <laughs> just, just to drive home the fact that, <laughs> that if you're looking for a place to store numbers, well, <laughs> uh, that's enough. Well, we know, yeah, we know DNA stores the genetic code, yeah. um, but there are other possibilities as well. I'm wondering what your current, so DNA is one possibility, right? Where uh, a code could be stored intracellularly. And to you, um, the key, I, I don't know if, I don't know your current thoughts on this, because it, it used to be that uh, you didn't know um, that there were, you know, a handful of intracellular mechanisms whereby you might store these things. Proteins degrade a little too fast, right? But then there are polymerases like RNA uh, could be one of the a substrate. DNA could be a substrate, but is DNA fast enough? What What's your current thinking on what might be the uh, substrate? Well, my I'm still sticking with polynucleotides, though I lean much more strongly to RNA than to DNA. Probably complexed with a protein to stabilize it. My thinking has taken a huge. Uh, boost lately from a wonderful paper by a young guy in uh, Gabby Maiman's lab at the Rockefeller named uh, Hesamadine Akhlagpur. Uh, it's just appeared in the Journal of Theoretical Biology in the last couple of weeks. Uh, oh. And uh, he come, he's an astonishing guy because he, he has a truly deep knowledge of um, theoretical computer science, much deeper than mine. I mean, he really knows the lambda calculus, right? Whereas I, for me, it's just kind of a name. Um, but at the same time, he really he has a much deeper knowledge of RNA biology than I do. But the most astonishing thing is that he, I mean, those two things are about as far apart as <laughs> conceptually <laughs> as you can readily imagine. And But he has this very rare mind that can bring those two things together. And he lays out a detailed story about computation performed at the RNA level in which RNA is both the symbols and the machinery that operates on the symbols. And he use, builds this on the, uh, on the Lambda calculus. And he, he lays out in his appendix in great detail an RNA machine that will add arbitrarily large numbers. Now, for all those computational neuroscientists out there in your audience, I claim that that has never been done by a CNN <laughs> and that it never will be done <laughs> mm. <laughs> by oh. at least by a non recurrent, uh, you know, through, by a straight through CNN. And even if it's done by a recurrent one, right, they're going to result resort to that old recycling the you know because you're going to have to store uh, you know addition is inescapably serial right so you've got to you've got to do the earlier the the less significant uh digits first and you mm -hmm. have to store that result and then transfer the carry to the next one and so on so you need memory and uh, so how do you get memory? Well, that's where recurrent nets come in, right? You, you keep sending them around the loop, uh, which uh, uh, in this paper by Akhlapur that I recommend in the strongest terms, uh, he also has a wonderful discussion of dynamic systems and why, uh, and why they're not stable, right? The very guy Moore who proved that they that they were Turing complete also argued very strongly that uh, they weren't stable. So they weren't physically realizable. The Turing complete ones were just a, a kind of mathematical dream. They weren't physically stable. Well, you, you, that's, that's, I didn't know about that more recent paper. You used to hang your hat on, and maybe you still do, uh, the Purkinje cell uh, finding in the cerebellum. And maybe uh, you'll just add this more recent uh, finding with RNA to your um, uh, to your talks now. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I I still think Frederick Johansson's discovery of the uh, development of that preparation, which was the culmination of a 40 year effort in Jerry Hessel's lab, uh, 
I still think that 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 what he has done is hand the molecular biological community uh, what they need on a platter. And for the first time, I think we could actually know the physical basis of memory while I'm still sentient. Uh, and uh, that would be a miracle because he's identified the beginning and end of an intracellular cascade. And one of the steps in that cascade clearly contains the engram that encodes the CSUS interval. I think his PhD work proved that beyond reasonable argument. And you know, look, molecular biologists know how to follow intracellular cascades, right? I mean, he identified the, the postsynaptic receptor at the start of this cascade, and it's a metabotropic receptor, right? Which means that it transfers the message from an extracellular source to an intracellular signaling chain. And, you know, there's almost certainly a G protein uh, on the inside of the membrane, and then that transforms and gooses the next thing and so on. And uh, molecular biologists have been tracing these cascades yeah. now for decades. And see, it's always been, how would I know that I'd gotten to the engram? But Johansson has solved that problem for them, if only they realize it. Because he proved that the information about the CSUS interval is not in the incoming signal that triggers this cascade, right? But he also identified a potassium channel, an inward rectifying potassium channel at the other end of the cascade, a channel that's a key to producing the pause, the timed pause that comes out of the cell, right? All right, so you're following this cascade, and until you get to the engram, the information about the duration of the interval won't be in any step you see, right? And on the other side of the engram, the information will be in the chain, right? Uh, because it's there by the time you get to this potassium channel. So you're following the cascade and all, at some point say, whoa, wait a second, look at that. This step is informed by the engram, all right? So... The engram lies between the preceding step and this step. Whoa, you know. But yeah, so so there was is the is the more recent uh, theoretical biology paper with the RNA. Uh, does it address the reading and writing mechanisms? Because that's that's what you'd have to follow, right, to that's, address reading and writing. Well, keep in mind. In fact, I strongly suspect if I can guess how things will play out that we will discover the engram before we understand either the writing or the reading mechanism. And again, I would appear here, appeal here to the history of, of, of DNA, right? The engram is the low-hanging fruit because hmm. it has a really simple job. Its only job is to store the information, right? Just like DNA's job is to store the information. Right? So, we are still learning how that stored information gets translated into actual organisms, right? Now, we've made enormous progress in that, uh, but there's still a very long way to go. And this has been going on now for decades, right? For 40, 50 years, ever since 1953. So the DNA story, the, that emerged pretty quickly. Right, the, the, the basic, okay, here's how the information is encoded, here's how it's carried forward in time. The story about uh, how it's read is five orders of magnitude more complicated, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can explain DNA to a smart undergraduate in half an hour, right? <laughs> uh, if, if he then asks, or she then asks, uh, okay, how do you get an I? <laughs> Then you say, well, okay, come to my advanced graduate seminar, and uh, we will spend the whole seminar uh, discussing what we understand about how you get from a gene to an eye, right? One of the astonishing things we've learned is that there is one gene that, you know, there's a gene, you turn it on, you get an eye, wherever you mm -hmm. turn it on, right? When I was being taught biology, uh, we were being taught one gene, one protein, which is, of course, still true. But everyone took it to be a corollary that if you thought there could be a gene for an eye, you were stupid. 
<laughs> because no one could imagine what how what I mean there was this huge gap between okay you got you know we're coding for a sequence of amino acids right and I isn't a sequence of amino acids um, how now again I would say the reason they couldn't imagine how it's done is they didn't know enough computer science right because uh, it turns out that the the protein that that gene encodes for isn't a building block in the eye. It's right. transcription factor, right? It's all transcription factors. Yeah. You have to go five or six steps down before you get past the transcription factors. Now, anybody who knows how relational databases work would say, well, duh. I mean, <laughs> or or how a function works, right? When you you know when you call the name of a function in MATLAB, <laughs> that just accesses the code for that function, right? Yeah, uh, and on and on, and to, on and uh, on. This I long mean, recursive loop. That's yeah. how you build complex operations out of simple operations, right? And that's what computation is all about. Let me let me try this out on you because um, just thinking about this, uh, talking about the. I, I know you just said that the read and the read mechanism is orders of magnitudes more complicated, and then the write mechanism must be even more complicated. I would imagine. It's until we know what the engram is. I think we. I, I refuse to think very long about this issue because I think mm. I don't know what it is. I need to know in order to think productively about it. Yeah, because yeah. The, the write mechanism has to translate from an incoming code in the spike train. And since we still look, despite the Rika et al. book, which I worship and from which I learned my information theory, we, I have friends, many friends, even my collaborator, Peter Latham, who thinks it's a great book, but I think that, well, it's just about the fly sensory neurons, right? Mm. <laughs> I say bullshit. It's the answer to how spike trains carry information, period, right? It's, it's all in the inner spike intervals. Well, and there's several bits per inner spike interval. Well, there's no agreement about that, right? So right. until there's agreement about how the information is encoded in the incoming signal and agreement about how it's encoded in the written thing, you can't think productively about what could the machinery look like that would take this code and produce that code. Any more than you could get from um, DNA to homeobox genes, right? Without knowing all the very complicated stuff that goes on in between. And then knowing how homeobox genes work, right? I mean, you know, they code for abstractions, anterior, distal. It's as if uh, somebody went to uh, anatomy lesson back in the Precambrian, right? Uh, no. <laughs> and they said, well, we got a code here for, we got to have a code for on the end of whatever it is we're building. <laughs> we have to have another code for what, anyway, you get my drift. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, let's let's pretend for a moment, just as a thought experiment, let, let's, it, we don't, it doesn't have to be RNA, but the, there's some, in intracellular mechanism, right? Yeah. And um, you, you just mentioned, uh, so <laughs> this is going to be kind of a long winding um, thought train here, but you you had just mentioned, you know, about the receptors and how there is this uh, enormously complex cascade from receptors to intracellular processes and um, that, that, anyway, that that's a, a long cascade. You also uh, mentioned convolutional neural networks in a derisive way, <laughs> playfully de derisive way. Um, however, thinking about a read-write mechanism, so you, you probably know that, um, you know, given a large enough um, neural network, that they are universal function approximators, right? They can transform from input to output, and the, you know, mathematically proven that they're universal function approximators. Talking about uh, the the cascade from uh, extracellular membrane protein to intracellular happenings mm -hmm. uh, sounds eerily like a neural network kind of process because you have all these interacting uh, subcomponents, right? The other thing um, that you, you mentioned that we just talked about briefly is that the majority product from DNA, from genes, is 
recursive is transcription factors, which feeds back onto the DNA, which regulates the protein synthesis. And the next protein is another transcription factor. That sounds eerily like recurrent uh, neural networks, right? (laughs) Feeding back. So, so uh, these these processes are, are, um, uh, one could make a very loose argument that they are, oh, what's the word? Not similar, not analog. Uh, analogous in some fashion. Yeah, yeah, I agree. They are analogous. They they clearly are. You, th- those analogies are traced out in the um, Peter Sterling and Simon Laughlin book on uh, right, um, in which they argue that compute with chemistry it's cheaper. <laughs> I, I think they're spot on by that. I would add ten orders of magnitude cheaper, right? <laughs> but but um, I think they don't slam just on how much cheaper. Uh, but they do these dynamic systems uh, analogs. Now, this same Akhlapur guy has a brand new blog post. I just got, I just saw it yesterday or day before yesterday, in which he takes up that proof of uh, a universal function approximator. And it shows, first of all, that it's not really true. It's only true on the uh, closed interval, not the open interval. So, but second of all, he, he revisits the argument. And so all the processes that you're describing are dynamic systems. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. And he revisits why you can't really do computation with stored information with dynamic systems. He has a much more sophisticated technique on this uh, take on it anchored in a much deeper understanding of the foundations of theoretical, theoretical computer science. But my much simpler argument, which I know he agrees with, um, is look, those proofs said, uh, well, what do we mean by a universal, uh, by a function approximator? Uh, a function approximator gets an input vector and it generates an output vector. Okay. Uh, that's the way a mathematician thinks about it, but it sure as hell not the way a computer scientist thinks about it. Um, because there's no memory in that, right? And a computer scientist is very aware that in your average computation, information comes in some of which was acquired 50 years ago. Uh, as we sit here talking, right? Uh, as I'm summoning up the words from in the English language, right? I learned most of them uh, when I was uh, less than five years old, right? So they've been rattling around in there uh, now for 75 years. However, now I'm forgetting many of them. It doesn't get better, let me tell you. (laughs) Dang it. (laughs) I'm beginning to have noticeable word finding uh, problems. And for someone Uh, whose verbal facility was always one of their great strengths, it's very painful. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. uh, I couldn't. The other day I was explaining something and I couldn't summon the word factorial. (laughs) <laughs> I was. I wanted to say the Sterling approximation, and I couldn't say what it was an approximation to because I couldn't retrieve the word factorial. Oh, gee. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> the the point is that real world computations require memory because you get one bit of information, you put it in memory. You get another bit, maybe 10 days later, maybe a year later, maybe 20 years later, you put that in memory and so on. If you look at uh, most of what we do, it's putting together at a given moment information that was acquired at many different times in the past. And that's what brains, when you're talking about real, so I hope it's clear why this makes that proof totally irrelevant, right? Because... <clears throat> That proof assumed that all that information had been very thoughtfully assembled for you by some genius and packaged into one humongous vector, and that we fed it to the computer and it generated in the the neural net and it generated an output vector. Well, of course, that's where you have to think about the system and when it has no memory. But that's, of course, just why. In throwing out the memory, they threw out the baby with the bath, right? Uh, well, the memory would be in the distributed connections, right? The distributed uh, weight, that, connection weights. That's a finite state machine in the proper definition of a finite state machine, which not it, which is not that it's finite. A finite state machine is a Turing machine that cannot read what it has written. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, 
that's mathematically equivalent to the usual definition. Uh, but it show, but if you're thinking about these things, it shows you what the huge difference between um, a Turing machine and a finite state machine. Uh, it can only it can only go from state to state with some transition rule and probability and so on. Let me hammer on this. Yep, a bit. So, if your iPhone or your mobile phone with its camera were a finite state machine, then it would have stored in its wiring diagram every picture that you're ever going to take with that phone. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> right? there, you can take more different pictures with that phone than there are elementary particles in the knowable universe, right? right, right. That's my definition of uh, a, a true infinity, right? Okay, so we didn't put all the possible pictures in the wiring diagram of that phone, right? We put in something that would convert quantum catches to switch throwers, you know, to, to memory elements. And of course, then the phone immediately gets busy running some compression algorithm um, because there's huge redundancy in the pixels, right? right? So, uh, uh, but a device without memory can't do any of that, right? No, no memory, no iPhone. So just stepping back, because often on this podcast, we talk about the current successes of the deep learning um, folks. Yes. <laughs> and um, a lot of that is being applied to neuroscience to understand uh, how brains function. And I know that you are aware of um, the, that the line of deep learning wherein from like Alex Graves and so on, where external memory has been supplied to the neural network. Um, but the book, Memory uh, and the Computational Brain, was actually written before the quote-unquote deep learning revolution when uh, deep learning started to dominate. So um, <laughs> for fear that uh, this diatribe could take the rest of the, the time. I'll keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you keep it short. I I'm curious about your thoughts on the uh, success and the ubiquity now of, of deep learning uh, and its application to understanding how neuroscience, how brains might function. Well, trying to keep it short. You remember the, the You don't have to keep it short, you, but you I, you know, we all have a famous line from The Graduate: "Plastics." <laughs> now, my my uh, wisdom distilled down to a very few words would be adversarial images. <laughs> sure. But what, what happens when that gets solved? But okay, well, we'll yeah. <laughs> when? <laughs> well, I have solved. I should have done air quotes. That's so. How, yeah. so the last time I checked, no solution was in sight. And it reflects a deep truth about how those systems work, right? Most people don't realize that when the um, image recognition so, uh, system inside Elon Musk's car, warns the rest of the system that there's a stop sign there, right? That system, because it's a deep neural net, uh, and because they don't know how to extract shape, what it's really decided is, look, these pixels are stop signish. <laughs> this region of the pixels has the statistics of a stop sign, right? <laughs> if you were to say, well, is it octagonal? then that would respond, what's an octagon? <laughs> right? uh, and even if you explain what an octagon is, the net, the, the net would say, look, I don't do shape. <laughs> uh, and at least I have noticed, and I think others will have noticed, that the hype about we were going to have auto, you know, self-driving cars sure. in the next five years has died down very considerably because the adversarial images taught the malevolent high, smart but malevolent high school students of which there is <laughs> too great a supply how to go out and hack every stop sign in town right uh with a you get yourself a crayon, piece of tape you get yourself yeah. a crayon and uh, you, yeah. you make various graffiti on the stop signs and ellen musk's cars will blow right through the stop signs right uh okay so uh hey guys i think it's wonderful that you uh got the system to work the way point where you do i'm not 
discounting this achievement. But when you start telling me this is how the brain works, and that means the brain has no memory, I say, I don't think so, because you can't do deep learning. I taught Jay McClellan years ago, and he and I have been arguing ever since. And well, I, he's, one of, he's one of the ones who's working on building math and reasoning into yeah, yeah. the network. I theory. keep yeah. telling him, hey, Jay, forget math and reasoning. Look, the ant and the bee do dead reckoning. Why don't you try that? Uh, I want to see how dead reckoning works in a system that has no memory. I've been taunting, I've been trolling him with that challenge now for 20 years, and uh, he doesn't bite. Because uh, I think, sure. like anyone, you look at dead reckoning and say, whoa, uh, we are going to have to store the current location, right? I mean, there's no way of getting around it. Uh, and that's going to extend over hours. Well, and yet, okay, so over hours is a point you might um, bring up again here, because I wanted to ask you, first of all, whether you're aware of, and then secondly, your thoughts on, um, there, there, are, there have been uh, deep learning networks paired with uh, reinforcement learning techniques in the AI world, that have used convolutional neural networks yeah. and used LSTMs yeah. that have done path integration in little maze environments, little yeah, toy um, environment. virtual maze environments. Toy. Yeah, and that's not, pardon? Toy environments in which- to Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, tile sure. tile the maze. Come on. <laughs> in order to make it fit into the reinforcement learning thing, they say, well, look, here's how we represent the maze, right? You see this tile that we tile it right and then each tile knows well then it gets interesting uh i haven't i think very few of them actually give the tiles metric information that is um i know that the a star algorithm which is how the google maps finds uh routes of course has metric information right it's all it's all there in the cost function uh so that's why Google sent around cars with GPSs, right, to record extremely precise metric information all over uh, all over the world. But in the ones that I've seen, the the reinforcement learning ones, they, uh, you know, reinforcement learning, they say, well, when you're in state one, you do you learn to do action one, and when you're in state two, you learn to do action two. First of all, this, they don't seem to realize that this is essentially identical to Clark Cull's theory. Uh, you know, that's what, when I say, uh, hey, I was listening to this nonsense 60 years ago. <laughs> but, you know, they don't put in any metric information. Come on. I'm a sailor. I'm a navigator. I'm a backcountry skier. I ski alone in the backcountry. Hey. Uh, you know, you don't tile the winter wilderness. You say, okay, I'm headed this way. The sun's over there. Uh, you work the way navigation has always worked. Uh, what direction am I going? How far am I going? How far? However, the average human is easily lost in that scenario, whereas the average bee or ant uh, isn't, isn't lost, right? Well, there are plenty of humans aren't lost either. I'm, I'm, by far, I'm by no means the only one who does backcountry skiing, even alone. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Joshua Slocum sailed alone around the world, right? Uh, um, using totally traditional navigational uh, methods, boasting with some good reason about his accomplishments. But uh, the, the reason... People don't know how to do this in the modern world as they always live in cities and they get from one place to another on taxi cabs and subways. So they're never, they're never called upon to do this. But when I was in uh, college, I worked one summer for a month until I turned them into the Better Business Bureau with the Collier's Encyclopedia selling encyclopedias door to door under the tutorship of a, of a man who had been doing this all his life. And uh, in those days, you sold these in the newly built suburbs, which had all these twisty roads and cul-de-sacs and so on. And yeah. you came in and you went all around and so on. And this guy was intensely proud of the fact that he always knew exactly how to get back out of there. And we would be driving around. I'd be totally lost. And he'd say, which way is the entrance? And I said, Jesus, I have no idea. <laughs> and, he, and he would point and he, he knew which way it was to the entrance within 10 degrees, no matter how long we'd been in there. So 
it's a matter somewhat of talent. Some people have more talent for it, but it's also a matter of habit, right? I mean, if you walked alone in strange foreign cities, maybe the first time you got seriously lost, but you learned something from it. Now, when you leave the hotel and you walk down and you get to the first corner, you turn around and look back. It's yeah. just what the bees do. <laughs> they, when they leave the hive, they turn around and look back. Right? But the fact that we can basically unlearn that skill and we would ha- you would have to learn it back, right, uh, argues, it, it could argue multiple different things. Uh, you know, the question that I want to ask you is if you think that there could be multiple memory mechanisms. You know, obviously, the quote unquote memory. Um, there are multiple types of memory defined, and that is continuing to change what kinds of memory that we have. So, you know, for example, something like episodic memory, where you can recall an event, right? And I know that you don't care about uh, mental phenomenon. Uh, but I believe you say- strongly in episodic memory. Uh, Crystal, Jonathan Crystal has demonstrated it beautifully in rats. And, and of course, uh, um, Nikki Clayton and... Uh, and um, Tony Dickinson demonstrated it spectacularly in those food caching birds, right? Uh, right. Of which, I'm only yeah, totally on board with episodic memory, but it's all numbers. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Time, so I'm thinking more location, of the location, right? Amount, uh, texture, uh, <laughs> what goes into an episode, right? Numbers. So to your mind, there is one memory mechanism uh, in all brains. That's what I think is by far the most likely. Uh, Of course, I don't know. And of course, it's conceivable that there are different learning mechanisms. But once you grasp how simple and how fundamental memory is, memory understood the way I understand it, right? Uh, Which is just Shannon's memory is a medium of communication. It's the... machinery, the medium, the material stuff by which the past communicates with the future. Now, Shannon, in his opening paragraphs, pointed out that, hey, look, if you're in, if communication is what you're about, and he might have stood up and said, I'm a communication engineer, and they pay me here at Bell Labs for communication. If communication is what it's about, you don't give a shit about the content, right? That was a truly profound insight, and I don't see why that doesn't apply just as much to the brain as it does to to computing disks, right? When I go buy uh, a new stick of gum to save a terabyte of information, right? They don't ask me, well, are you going to use this for word processing or spreadsheets or, or MATLAB files? It's all just information when it comes to communication, and memory is is communication. So it's a really, I think DNA is, a, again, look, evolution solved this problem once. It found a really good solution. That was uh, probably two billion years ago. <laughs> right? It seems uh, animals have been navigating since the Precambrian. We can tell just from their tracks in the mud, right? So um, you can't navigate without a map, without a memory. Uh, all these. So in one of your other questions, you asked about how about skills, right? Motor skills. Uh, motor skills. Yeah. Uh, the, if it's going, if there is going to be a case where it's different, then I would say, well, that could easily be where. But I kind of doubt it because. I think skills can be, and I'm a student of the motor literature, I've written about it at some length occasionally. Um, I think skills can be learned as parameter tuning. That is, you've got a a system that's an incredibly versatile memory system. This stuff was all in my first book. And the best- The organization of learning? No, the organization of action. There's another book from 10 years before that. Okay, gotcha. but I, and, and what I'm saying is, this is not original with me. This is very much there in the literature that was in that book. And, and it's there in, say, Eve Martyr's work, right? With the stomatogastric ganglion, right? Mm-hmm. You, you've got this set of oscillators, a very simple circuit, right? But there's oscillators and some feedback. Uh, feedback is important, don't get me wrong. <laughs> 
but only under certain in certain circumstances. And there's, uh, of course, inputs, inhibitory inputs, and what have you. But the way the system is basically controlled is by um, signals that come down from higher in the nervous system and adjust the parameters. Right? Yeah, they, so, and parameters, we're back to numbers, right? <laughs> what, what are parameters? They're numbers. <laughs> so I have uh, a memory from, well, I don't know if it was three or four years ago. So my memory for time is not great. But uh, we held, my wife and I uh, held a chili cook-off at our house. And um, I won't tell you how my entry did. I can tell you I didn't win the trophy. But um, there was a particular entry uh, that tasted a lot. It was, the flavor was dominated by celery. Um, and I remember this. And I think it got last place. It was just overwhelming <laughs> celery. Uh, she's, she's a, she was a vegetarian and uh, kind of a whole, holistic medicine also person. But anyway, I was talking to her about it the other day, and I can remember that uh, she felt a little, um, you know, sad, sad yeah. about this. But, but I, but I, but I have this episodic memory, and we don't need to go on about episodic memory. I have this, you know, experiential memory of what that was like, and the flavor of the celery, and me not winning, also, you know, and all that kind of. Um, and I can picture our our house and stuff. So I, I guess the the question is, does the num- the intracellular numerical mechanism uh, account for that type of experiential memory? Well, not without some spelling out of additional hypotheses. So, but I did address your question at considerable length in the near final chapter of my 1990 book entitled The Unity of Remembered Experience. That book has been cited many thousands of times, but as near as I can tell, no one ever read that chapter. If they did, they dismissed it. Uh, because it it addresses exactly the question you're posing. Uh, how do these diverse aspects of an experience, and the experience extends over time and space and involves many different components, the t- taste of the celery and so on, how do they all get knit together? And I argue there that, first of all, they're not knit together by associations because you, that brings you into an explosion, right? You, you, you have a combinatoric explosion. You get this net of uh, uncountably many associations. The unity, the phenomenological unity, uh, arises in the process of uh, recollecting the experience and that you use time and place indices, all memories on this story, have a time stamp and a location stamp. And I present, I review experimental evidence for that claim. And this is now, of course, 30 years old. Uh, and there are more evidence for it of a somewhat similar nature has emerged uh, with uh, in the intervening 30 years. But I spell out in some detail how you could use, if every memory, if they're all in separate bins and separate neurons and so on, but they all have as one of their fundamental components uh, a time and a location stamp, which plays the role of the um, the operon in uh, DNA, right? It's the address. Mm-hmm. Then you can move uh, among these memories in recollecting an experience that is you because episodes are always located in at a time and in a place. They're located in space time, right? And so you can retrieve the facts if using those indices. As I read the hippocampal literature, the neurons, I think, yeah, I see. I say someday there, some. Well, I actually, I can, I can bound. The guy who died, How, Howard. I can bound. Uh, I can bound. Howard, I can bound. He was starting to argue this same sort of thing, and I wrote mm-hmm. him. I said, "Hey, Howard." Uh, <laughs> Go read my chapter. I, I, this is what I was arguing 30 years ago. And he wrote back and he said, yeah, I've been reading it. You're right. You were arguing this. I'll cite you in the in the future. And then he died. <laughs> um, oh. but, uh, totally aside. Yeah. But this happens over and over. And you've been around long enough to have experienced this, this personally where new ideas are not new ideas. Oh, They've sure. been written about, in, in, buried in chapters. Yeah. Uh, um, so how many times has this happened to you? Oh, 
I don't get uptight about it, for one thing, as I, because I'm a sinner. I'm both a sinner and sinned against, as witness the Chomsky sure. is. Right, the Chomsky. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I I I wasn't angry. I just I thought Howard and I could make common cause here, right? Uh, yeah, and I was deeply disappointed when he died. You got, you got to stay alive <laughs> to keep doing science. You got to stay alive. Stay with me here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that's the general answer. I mean, take celery for a moment for a specific thing. So it has qualia of grapes, but then mm -hmm. so does color, right? And if there's mm -hmm. one thing we've known now for more than a century: color is represented in our brains with three numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, the story for both taste and odor has emerged the same. It, they're all vector representations. The, the dimensionality of the spaces is higher. But these days, Doris Sao and uh, lots of people are pushing vector representations really hard. And mm -hmm. of course, vectors, they're just strings of numbers, right? And and they represent faces. And, and um, Chuck Smith has argued that the same story is true for odor, even in Drosophila. So again, the celery, it's all numbers, right? It's uh, the tastes are represented in a four dimensional space. Colors are rec represented in a three dimensional space. Faces are represented in a 50 dimensional space. You get the idea. Two more questions and then I'll let you go. And I'm, I appreciate you hanging around with me. One, what is the role of synaptic plasticity? <laughs> um, no one knows, least of all me. <laughs> you, I, I thought I assumed that you were going to say encoding, uh, writing. I, I honestly have no idea. I, I mm. since I literally believe that an associative bond never formed in the brain of any animal, mm -hmm. and since the plastic synapse is transparently conceived of as uh, an associative bond, right? I certainly don't think that's what they are. Right? Could they play a role in the computations carried out in signals? Sure. Do I have any? Um, seems likely that they probably do. But uh, do I have any good ideas what that role might be? No. Um, does anyone else? I don't know. I don't follow the literature very carefully, but everybody seems so hung up on the idea that they're associative bonds that I think until they dig themselves out of that conceptual hole, they're never going to find out what they're really about. What's keeping you up at night these days? What are you thinking hard about that's just beyond reach to you? Oh. Hmm. Well, how to get the molecular biologist to realize that Frederick O. Hansen has offered them the world on a plate. How's that fight going? Very slowly. <laughs> and they're hung up for what is best I can make out are quasi metaphysical reasons. So, for example, Thomas Ryan, who uh, he'll be he'll be on the next episode. Yeah, actually. okay. So you can follow up on this. So you can you ask him what his problem with Randy's story is because he and I have been <laughs> arguing and corresponding. Uh, uh, he, I never heard of him. I I had given talks at MIT where I imagine he was present and. Uh, and I met Tony Gao a few times, but um, whose lab he came out of. But yeah. he emailed me that the when it, the day it was unembargoed, his science paper when he was still in Tony Gao's lab, showing that they could make the plastic synapses go away and the information was still there. And the email said, "I think you'll find this interesting." <laughs> and I wrote back, "Yes, I find this very, very interesting indeed." Okay, so he and I agree that the information isn't stored in the synap in the plastic synapses. And he admits that he does not have a story about how the information is stored. The engram. But the engram. Well, it's, He's all focused it's, on these cell assemblies. He's focused on this sparse coding. And I say, yeah, Thomas, Thomas, that's all very interesting. But we both think that the real name of the game is looking for the engram. And those cell assemblies, they aren't the engram. Your own work shows that it must be inside those cells. I can't get him to go there, and it's all hung up about information. He doesn't like the idea that we have to think in terms of Shannon information. He's read Dennett, and he, he believes that there's 
in semantic information. And I, I know Dennett very well. We have a lengthy email correspondence in which I'm trolling Dennett, Daniel, saying, Daniel, the fact is, you have no idea what you mean by semantic information. And Dennett more or less admits that that's true. And I said, Tomas, you know, Shannon information is the only game in town. Uh, semantic information is just philosophers hand-waving. So, but 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 the recent optogenetic work, where yeah. um, you know particular cells and and networks sure. of cells, they can excite the they can excite behavior that is informed by the stored information. They've shown that over and over again, and now people are showing it in the hippocampus, right? But that doesn't change your story. It doesn't change your view because it doesn't even address the question I'm posing, which is, all right, you excite those cells. And the output signals from that cell is informed by acquired information. Where is it? <laughs> did, did some neighboring cell say, oh, Joe, you need to know this, right? Uh, or as your own experiments tend to show, they got that information from inside themselves. Well, once you get inside a cell, it's all molecules, right? Uh, very big, complicated molecules and networks of molecules. Networks of molecules, even railroads and structures build. I mean, the ribosome, right. for example. But but basically, we're down to the molecular level of structure, right? And uh, and I keep saying, Tomas, your own work shows that that's the case. I cannot persuade him. And um, it's just driving me nuts. I mean, the uh, Johansson work is uh, five or six years old now. And I thought, oh, wow, this is the breakthrough. Now all those uh, insanely ambitious molecular biologists, they'll jump on this and they'll trace that cascade and they'll use this ability to, to observe single molecules fluorescing inside individual cells. I mean, They've created the most astonishing tools. And once they get to the engram, they can slice and di dice it with CRISPR and so on, and they can find out the code. It seems to me like this is so obvious and I cannot. Well, Randy, <laughs> you've learned multiple things throughout your career. Why don't you just go learn molecular, uh, <laughs> experimental molecular biology and start on it? <laughs> Not a chance. I'm 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it takes a long time to become a molecular biologist. And besides that, I would have to get a grant and so on. I mean, that's the other thing. <laughs> the uh, And then there's no way with somebody with my background could get a grant. I, I mean, this effort, although it seems to me obvious how, what the general strategy is, I don't mean to minimize how difficult it would be yeah. and the kind of resources. I mean, you need the kind of money that only a molecular biologist can get. I mean, people like me, we get the the, the rounding error in the molecular biology grants, right? Uh, so you're not going to pursue that cascade with uh, $20,000 a year, right? Uh, it's going to be more like $5 million a year, right? Um, and it needs to become competitive, which it always does in molecular biology. That is, if one or two of the smartest young upstarts started doing this, then the rest of the field would say, oh, shit, maybe I'm missing the train. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I better get on that train before it leaves the station, right? I'm trying to stir up that kind of anxiety. <laughs> wow, <Well, laughs> yeah. But so far, I've not succeeded. <laughs> well, you've been driving your train for a long time along those those very tracks. So this is a great place to leave it. I'm gonna I'll play that uh, last little clip there for Tomas when we talk, perhaps, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and he can respond. Yeah. Thank you for the very very fun uh, conversation. Keep up the good fight, Randy. I appreciate it. I enjoyed this enormously. Thank you. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.
stare 